Okay, my name is Christina Anderson. I'm based in Amsterdam, uh, as Susan said. I work increasingly, I work with technologies and ideas of technology that hasn't been thought of yet. I mean, you could think of these as future technologies, but you can also just think of them as yet to be imagined technologies. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the future as such. And one of the things that is happening to my work is that I'm increasingly, I'm using less and less actual technology in these imaginations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the background for this and then give one example and talk a little bit more about the sort of logic or how it works. We did a little workshop a couple of hours ago today here, um, which was um, similar to the thing I'm going to talk about. So it's something that is an ongoing process for me. So this footage is a cloud chamber. Cloud chambers are classic devices from science museums, from physics. What they are, are little boxes filled with the steam of alcohol under certain conditions. They, because the uh, air is super saturated with alcohol, radioactive radiation shows as little steam trails. And these things were made for, you know, investigating radioactive uh, rays. And what you'll see is the little um, tower there, the little thing here in the corner. Um, that's an isotope. So it's a something they put into the steam chamber, you know, that they know is radioactive. And you see little steam trails come out of it, you know, in a circle. But then the thing, the other thing that you see is that there's all this other stuff happening. These big fat trails, that's background radiation. That's not really meant to be there. That's just something that the cloud chamber makes visible. And it's a li it's a, what I, li I like to work in live situations, workshop-like situations, and I like to think of them as steam chambers in the sense that you set them up thinking you're going to investigate a particular thing, but it's very important to be able to pay attention while you're there for all the other stuff that might become visible inside the situation. So this is one of the things I like about this particular visual. And of course, this is classic quote by Whitehead saying, a traveler who has lost his way should not ask, where am I? What he really wants to know is, where are the other places? Now, most technology and science developments in universities are incremental. So that means that we, we tend to make uh, an improvement on the things we had already. We open the adjacent possible door and have a series of other doors that we can open. This is just literally how science, academic science, is set up to work. If you want to be a PhD student, you're encouraged to ask a little question that advances knowledge one step into the unknown, and then the, the map will be redrawn, you know, with a little bit more white space of, uh, of what you discovered. This means that from, from the point of view of most non-technologists, most normal people, untrained people, civilians, Technology becomes sort of a question of accepting and rejecting the things that are served up. You know, things turn up and you go, oh, that's great, I will, I will have that. Or, you know, I'm not liking that so much. And one of the things that I would like to propose in my own work is that prototyping is maybe not just for scientists and designers, but maybe it's a way of allowing people who don't necessarily normally participate in these conversations to have an idea about the future, to have an idea about what is not discovered yet. So, how can we practice at the unknown, talk about and act around what is yet to be imagined, is sort of my question. Now, I'm interested in this in relationship to objects and the meaning that resides as potential around them inside their design space. And the way I tend to try and release that is through experiences, through creating moments of play and of investigation. Now, there's two quotes that I use quite often. They're fairly mainstream quotes. They're not difficult. Um, this is also a reflection of me normally working with people who have no formal training in this. And the first one is from Mino from Plato's Dialogue. It's very naughty to use this quote. A philosopher would be very cross with you. Because Mino is a straw man. He's asking the kind of questions that Plato gets to answer and show off how smart he is. But the question is, how will you go about finding the thing, the nature of which is totally unknown to you? which I think is a pretty good question. And the other one is Arthur C. Clarke, the writer of 2001, Space Odyssey. Um, he was asked how to predict technology, because he did that a lot. 
um, through his work. And he came up with three rules. The first two rules are perfectly believable and boring, but the third one says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I, if it's sufficiently advanced, if it's not the adjacent possible, if it's not just an improvement of what you had yesterday, then the first time you meet it, you're going to not know at all what it is. It's going to be strange to you. Now, so the question I like to, to use as a guide in my work is how can physical objects and props facilitate us in acting and thinking with our hands as a method of accessing this technological magic? So making objects is both a method of thinking about and imagining ideas, but also a way of teasing out the new and the unexpected from the everyday and the mundane. And if future technological objects are unimaginable on par with and yet to experience, be experienced magic, like Arthur C. Clarke saying, then how do we design that magic? Or can we use that magic as a way of turning the design process inside out or upside down and say, what kind of magic would you like? I think it's a w it's, it can be a way of getting into looking at some of these things. So, I'm going to skip this. So, the unknown. What would you really like if you could have anything? This is a really terrible question. It's very difficult to answer. It's, uh, if anybody's ever tried to do future design workshops with students, you will know that you'll get very, very little in return for, an answer for a question like this. So, what I'm going to... What I'd like to do is to talk about a particular set of workshops called the OWL workshops, the OWL circle workshops, that were a very performative set of circles that are designed to allow everybody to be able to answer that question in a emotionally coherent and fully embodied fashion. So the way we do this is that we take thr the students or the participants through a very strict process. And it is, this thing is choreographed as if it's theater. In fact, it is theater. So we have an introduction. We have something called the desires. We have a m number of switches, which I will talk about. And then we have a description at the end. So the first thing we do, right, the first thing we do is we have people coming in to a room that is fairly neutral in quality, as neutral as you can get it. Not always possible. And what we do is we start them with a found object. We found this list. It's a guy called Steven Reis. He's from Motivational Psychology. He made this list called the 16 Basic Desires. It's an excellent found object because everybody has beef with this list. You know, this is the 16 Basic Human Desires. You know. No, not 17, and exactly. And also 16 is a really good long number. I mean, like, you know, we can all agree that it'd be nice to not get killed in our sleep and have enough food, but once you get to 16, it gets to include things like vengeance and idealism and the need to be loyal to the traditional values of one's clan or ethnic group. So there is a lot of stuff to have potential beef with, and the wording is problematic in many ways. I mean, for starters, romance, the need for sex. You can imagine how well that goes down in certain groups. Um, this makes it an excellent found object. So what we do is we serve up these desires. And I should say this is a collaboration with my good friend Daniel Wild. So we tend to run these, these workshops together. And what we do is we read them out. And we have them on index cards. And as we read them out very formally, we put them on a table. There's several of each, and we ask each participant to pick one. Just pick one. Pick the one you hate the most or intrigues you. Just There's always going to be one, one that tickles you. Pick one. We don't want to hear why. This is the first estrangement switch. We're asking you to do something meaningless. Second estrangement switch. Where in your body does this desire reside? Again, this makes no sense at all. This is similar to the children's game. You know, if you were a tree, what kind of tree are you? You know, it's, it's just a whatever. But what it does is it just makes... You've just been asked to do something strange, and now you're being asked to do something strange on top of that. So you're turning the globe another line. Then you have a third estrangement switch. We ask people to... They're not telling us where in their body they're working. They're just considering it. And then we're asking them to pick a material. And, and we have a let's say basically a table full of materials. Go and pick some materials. Within about 
10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. If we're good, it's about seven minutes. We have just taken people through three estrangement switches, which means that they're now completely and utterly free to do whatever the hell they want, because this is getting very weird. And we've taken complete responsibility for the situation. And we ask them to start making. We don't tell them what they're making. I didn't do that earlier in the workshop either. And strangely enough, people do. You know, we just ask them three very strange questions and ask them to start making, and they do. And then you have a period of the workshops where it's very practical. Can I have the scissors? You know, oh, can you hold this while I tape it up? And you know, that kind of stuff. The kind of materials we use are typically recycling, dumpster diving stuff, wood, cardboard, bubble wrap, whatever we can get our hands on. So we're just making. And it's a kind of a cheerful sewing circle kind of feeling, uh, a lot of kind of, can I have the tape? Can I have the scissors? And then there's a strange thing. At some point, you're done. You're finished doing this weird thing that you're doing. And it's very visible. It's very obvious to anybody who's in the room that, oh, that person over there is done. So in a sense, the experience of making it is a physical thing that can be exam and examined and turned and changed and it's, you know, literally at some point is done. So what we do typically, in, particularly in the situation of the video I'm about to show you, is that in a part of the gallery space we're working, we have set up a very dramatic looking video setup. We go out and we, buy a, we borrow the biggest video camera we can get our hands on. You know, like something looks like television if we can. We, Go out and borrow something like this, a wireless mic. We don't really need it, but it's just for drama. There's a big red cross on the floor and a black backdrop. This thing is from plain view. Everybody's seen it. It's been there the whole hour or hour and a half they've been working. So whenever people are done, we go over and go, oh, right, you know, are you done? What's your thing you're working on? Yeah, okay. They go, yeah, I'm done. I'm going, all right, come with me, please. We walk them over to, and we ask them to stand on the cross. And we start fitting them with a the microphone. And we say, while we're doing that, it's a very intimate thing to be fitted with a microphone as anybody. It's a very intimate thing to be fitted with anything. You know, there's a person handling you, right? And you don't know, you're kind of in their power. And um, while we're doing that, we're saying, in a moment, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to turn on the camera. And when the camera turns on, I'm going to ask you to tell me in one take. I'm not going to interview. I'm just going to ask you to speak. Tell us your name the desire that you chose, the name of the thing that you built and how it works. We have not introduced these questions at all, at any point. And they have exactly mm, 15 seconds. That's how long it pretty much takes me to go over there and press the button on the camera. And what you then get is a situation where you have artificially held back language. We have not talked about what we were building at all, at any point. And what they have created are props. And they're empty, they have no scenario of use. Very few of them has made any thoughts about what it is this thing done, do, or, or anything like that. So what you get on the footage is people thinking on their feet and language filling in. So basically, what is, it's like there's a void in there. So we're building physical objects and we're letting the scenarios of use be filled in after the case. So this is kind of the moment where everything crystallizes out. And I'm going to show you a little bit of footage from this particular set of workshops we did in Sydney. And with a bit of luck, it'll run. My name is Jennifer, and my desire is eating. I have made the mastica mastica <laughs> mastication amplifier. And it's for those food enthusiasts who really like to enjoy food and the sound that uh, eating and mastication makes and the yeah the, the bonnet that i am wearing amplifies those those are beer glasses so the following footage is our intern demonstrating the interface <laughs> it's so strange. <laughs> I 
I think this is the most intense apple I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> this thing is unusual in the fact that it actually works. Oh. <laughs> I had to take it off, it was too weird. So my name is Alice McAuliffe. Um, I chose curiosity, the need to think. This is actually my headache because I've been doing a lot of thinking lately and researching. Um, and this is sort of in a sense um, a physical manifestation of all the different thoughts that go on in someone's head and the different way that they twist around each other and get very complicated. If this was a technology in the future, what I would really like to see is some sort of way that you could remove your thoughts from your head and look at them outside of your mind. In some way, a machine that could separate your thoughts for you because often when you're researching, everything is quite confusing and gets very entangled. Does it have a name? My headache. This is called my headache. I'd like to say that I haven't been picking uh, the desire here. That I chose All of them are like that. Was to, um, I guess to have expected I'm going to skip a little bit through and show you some surprised. of the children. Obviously, the children are good at this. I mean, nobody's really surprised. So the first one is Finbar. He's six. He's holding a stick in his hand so that he won't fall over. It's pure safety. It has nothing to do with his um, interface. Finbar? Finbar, what is the word that you chose? Uh, uh, physical activities. Physical activities. And what did you make? Um, on stilts. Stilts. So what are you still selecting to do? Um, jump around and blast up to the moon. Blast up to the moon? Yes. Yeah. What's on the back of your legs there? Uh, cups. Cups? Yeah. What do the cups let you do? Um, they help me... Uh, the secret gadgets. Good answer. Okay. Are you allowed to tell us what your secret gadgets do or is it totally secret? Totally secret. So what's your name? Sylvie. This is Sylvie, she's four. what is this word? Um, engine. Vengeance. Why? What did you say when we said vengeance? Where did you say vengeance came from in your body? Your face. Face. What part of your face? Uh, your eyes on your mouth. Your eyes and your mouth. That's right. Can you remember what the word is now? Yeah. What is it? Um, engine. It's very hard to speak when you have a packing noodle in your mouth. All right, so my name is Lizzie Muller, and my word was acceptance. My desire was acceptance. And um, I think on the back of the card it said something about wanting to belong, but I didn't read that until a bit later, so I was doing a different kind of acceptance. I was doing accepting things that happen to you. Yes, this was my thing for accepting things that happen to you. And you want me to tell you how it works? What's it called and what does it do? Oh, does, how, does it have to have a name? Give it a name, right now. Um, um, the acceptance vest. The acceptor vest. <laughs> yes, the acceptor vest. Um, and what does it do? Well, I was really kind of thinking about how acceptance feels when it's in your body. And I was thinking that acceptance feels like a kind of filling up. So these vessels are kind of like for filling up, perhaps imaginatively or maybe even really. Um, yes, these, these are the filling up vessels. And I also thought acceptance was a little bit like um, scaffolding, you know, for the heart and so that you can kind of stand tall and cope with whatever happens. So I built this thing which was kind of scaffolding, but it's quite soft, gentle, scaffolding it's more kind of support so yes this supports and this fills up and that's that's it I i'm going to stop them here i mean like it goes on and on and the the when we did this particular thing we were scheduled to we were scheduled to do an exhibition with the results of this and there's something incredibly nerve-wracking to turn up in australia knowing you're going to have a big cheesy white gallery opening and you're bringing nothing 
and you know it's in two weeks. So basically, we were very nervous going into this process, knowing all that we had to exhibit was this. But in, in the end, we ended up exhibiting almost everything, everything people gave us permission to exhi exhibit. Because this is pretty much what you get. And not all of this, of course, is technologies or technological ideas, but most all of it has very strong scenarios associated with them, which allows one to potentially triangulate a particular direction. So sometimes the making process, the actual making, allows you to shut up your inner voices for a moment. This internal monologue that stops us from working most of the time. And actually sitting down and making something in a limited, time-limited process can be very liberating that way. So in a sense, we try to make a tent in time. And in that tent, experimentation can take place. It's not unlike a game in that sense. I don't mean a game game, but a playful situation. So enchantment is a useful word to describe this drive that allows not just a Coleridge-esque willing suspension of disbelief, but rather an engaged reimagination of the world. And some of the things that come into this is, of course, pretend play. It's a classic children's psychology thing. Everybody's seen children with pieces of sticks thinking they're lights, playing their lightsabers. It's not that those kids think that those things are lightsabers. I mean, they're fully aware that they're sticks. You know? It's just that for the moment, it is a damn lightsaber for the purpose of this game. And this is the same thing that happens in these workshops. I mean, these people are fully aware that they're wearing basically stuff from a dumpster strapped to their forehead. I mean, they're fully aware of this. I mean, they're not insane. And, but for the moment, it allows them to take the place of, of somewhere where they can fill in something else, something more subtle and something that maybe doesn't otherwise get a voice. This leads on magical, ba is based on magical thinking in various ways. Magical thinking is what you use when you're not quite sure how things work. Classical magical thinking is things like, you know, I stepped on the lines in the street and now it's raining. Or, you know, or it's raining because I'm sad, even more basic. Or um, I shouldn't have sworn at the photocopy and now it's not working. I mean, speaking nice to the car on the frosty day. All of this stuff is magical thinking. It's confusing effect with cause. Making strange is another thing that plays into this. We are deliberately making these things strange in an art sense. Making strange is a classic art strategy where you say, the, 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 the basis of it is saying that the time you have to experience a piece of art lies between the moment you encounter it until you label it. So the first time you see a Picasso, till the moment you go, oh, it's a blue lady with both eyes on one side of the, oh, it's a Picasso, even. That moment, that period, is that moment where you can experience art. After that, you're just going, oh, it's a Picasso. You know, oh, it's a nice one, you know, or not. Um, but and that's where a lot of the surrealism in art and all the um, uh, making strange and defamiliarization comes from. So the idea is that you make the world stranger in order to allow you to stay in that imaginative space for longer. So, can we use this idea of making strange to create these moments of enchantment where we can allow ourselves to discuss these things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to discuss? Um, Enchantment is very driven by sensuousness, about the quality of things. It is incredibly important for these situ situations to work, that they act like theater in the sense that, to some extent, people need to be reassured and know that they're safe within these environments, that they are welcomed into them, and that, you know, no one's gonna, you know, make fun. And the experiments here are all conducted inside these temporary playful spaces, where in which we're open to the possibility of change. In that sense, what we're trying to do is to build souvenirs from the future. A souvenir, of course, is this thing that you buy, it's mass-produced often, or it's a piece of trash, and you use it to sort of think that you can bookmark a moment or a place in time. And of course, a souvenir is a broken promise. It sits on your shelf and it promises to connect you back to that trip to Paris. Of course, it won't actually do that. It is, you know, it's failing as magic, it's failed magic. But in a similar way, we're building these kinds of objects that somehow point 
in a way that will fail towards these kind of uh, imagined futures. And that sort of leads me back to the cloud chamber. Uh, Judith Butler states that we are required to risk ourselves precisely at moments of unknowingness, when what forms us diverges from what lies before us, when our willingness to become undone in relation to others constitute our chance of becoming human. And this is maybe very sort of dramatic, but it is this sense that you have these moments where you are asked questions, and you, are you choose to answer them in a way that is truthful in that moment. And these are moments where you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable in the face of what you do not know. And quite often there will be truths in there. So these are sort of some of the elements that we're looking at. And of course it means that there's a huge question in here about how do we do this with ordinary people. I think it's important to underline again that I'm not doing user testing, I'm not doing probing, I'm not looking for future scenarios for telecom companies. I don't really care about any of those things, I guess I could. But um, I'm interested in people's imaginations and how they may manifest themselves in objects. Technology is the closest thing we have to magic. Think about all the new things, nanotechnology, Stem, stem cell research, genetic manipulation. We, you know, the, we all know these and think, oh yeah, there's a lot of work on that, isn't there? But nobody knows what it looks like. So I can hand you a thing and say, oh, this thing is enriched with nanotechnology. And you wouldn't know. It could be true. These are, these are, these are technologies and pieces of knowledge that have no body, really have no body. We're not just talking about the disappearing computer here. We're talking about things that have no surface at all. How do we touch them? How do we remain in a situation where we have agency? And also, part of this, these kinds of processes are also about how do we develop ethical and cultural responses to technological advances? You know, how do we allow innovation to be something that be conducted outside of the lab? By ordinary people. By, you know, your mum and your little brother who have no idea what you do for a living. You know, don't we all have one of those? So I think that's about me. Yeah. You might need that to, uh, oh yeah, to answer some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. You actually caught me off guard there because I was going somewhere without surface in a completely magical space. But now I'm present again and I'm moderating and we have <laughs> questions. Valérie? I wanted to know in the OWL workshop if it was a parameter that the designs be uh, wearable or that be body specific. No. Okay. We did ask them specifically, where in your body does this desire reside? But we thought it was just, we didn't necessarily design it to be wearables, but all of them were wearables. I mean, the things that I said that we said are literally all. We are very, very aware of priming. It's very easy to prime the people you're working with. This is something that anybody who does any workshopping or testing with people must be very aware of. It's very easy to tell people what you want them to deliver. And it's tempting, because, you know, hey, who wouldn't like a nice set of data? But, um, but we try to be very, very strict about what we say. I mean, to the point where it's literally scripted. So no chit-chatting. Which means I wouldn't wave at me, so she has a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do it? Why? <laughs> um, well, actually, okay, I mean, this, of course, comes in a l much larger body of work, obviously. This is just, I thought I'd pick this one because of the theme of today. Um, and instead of, like, having another talk where you're going, and then I did, and then I did, and here's what I did on my holiday. Um, this comes as a second stage of a project where initially we build props, body props, uh, that were non-technological and asked people to imagine what they did. And this was very interesting and, you know, it was good for us to do. But we immediately kind of went, actually, 
why do we get to build them? What, what happens if we open it completely? Because increasingly, the more I work, I work a lot with children, I work a lot with adults in these kinds of situations, and increasingly, my experience is that, and this is going to sound really silly, but people are incredibly interesting. Like, everybody is interesting. And it's really easy to, uh, as a designer or as an artist, to think, oh, you know, I have, eight, you know, I am the big author. And it was, it's, it was very liberating to once in a while to give that, some of that away and, 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 and then have the experience that people blow you away. We just did a workshop out there, and somebody designed an interface for, for manipulating reality that was really, really complex and used layers of colored gels to allow you to slow down and speed up your perception of reality. I thought that was fantastic. It was made in a burned out tea candle. You know, it's just a little handheld object. And somebody else made an interface for forgetting the thing that you said. So I thought it was genius. You know, never mind forgetting what other people say to you. What you really want to be able to forget is that stupid thing you said. You know? But, hmm? All right, yeah. Well, maybe, um, I think the other device was maybe been more health conscious. Uh, but what I mean to say is that, that it's just, it comes from this idea that People are amazing. And, and, and very few people have the experience in life that they're asked very good questions. When was the last time somebody asked you a question where you felt that th your answer might change something? It happens very rarely. Maybe it will happen right now. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, I hope so. Um, that's a good layout for this question. I know, dude. Um, are you feeling scared yet? <laughs> no, not yet. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about, I, I really love what you said about technology being the closest thing to magic that we have. Mm -hmm. Something I'm kind of thinking, it kind of coincides with what I'm thinking about right now. And I'm curious as to, at least in the art world, why is it that analog technology usually represents mag magic? Do you know what I mean? How, how, you know, technology, high technology or modern technology is often seen as a purely scientific thing. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about magic and technology, in photography, for example, you talk about film, you talk about development, you talk about, you know, analog chemical processes. Why does that appear to be more magical than technology right now? I think, I think it has to do with this bodylessness of certain technological developments. I'm literally just back from Hong Kong where I'm doing a nanotechnology project. We have no actual nanotechnology in this project. We're doing pretend nanotechnology. It's surprisingly easy because nobody <laughs> knows what the hell this stuff looks like. So, you know, we're just faking it, right? And we're faking it because we want to see, like, you know, if, if I can convincingly, you know, wear a lab coat and, and, you know, corner somebody who wouldn't know any better, and convincingly tell you that I'm giving you a device that is filled with MEMS, microelectronic mechanical systems, which in theory I could if I had enough money. I mean, there's nothing, you know, unplausible about it. Then suddenly the magic comes. But when you just have it as a word, as something that you think possibly is in your iPhone, but you don't know what it does, other than possibly save on battery, it's hard to, there's, Where's the narrative? Where's the storytelling around it? And that also means that it's very difficult to reject it or accept it in a way that isn't just based on um, dogma. You know, like, I'm against technology because I am. You know, because it's, how are you going to handle it? So I think some of it is also a little bit our imagination running behind, you know? And, and of course, the film has this thing that it has visuals. You know, so it's cheating. In that sense, you know, I mean, you know, we all like pretty pictures. But, um, but I think it's this bodylessness that, that comes into it. I do a lot of work on, I'm, I'm working on um, another project with uh, a professor of pharmacology on placebo effect. We can obviously not use the word placebo because it's been used so much in art context that everybody will go. But basically what's happening within um, pharmacology now is that they have a problem in what they call compliance that people do not take medicines that'll stop them from dying, even if they just could, and then they won't die. There is really a tendency for people to not keep their drugs up. 
Like, even simple, obvious stuff like, I am a diabetic, I should probably take my insulin. I mean, it's, I mean there's lots of reasons why people might, might go want to go off their psycho meds, psych meds, but like something like insulin, for example, is problematic in terms of making people do it, even if the alternative is, let's say, going blind and losing your feet, which, you know, is pretty serious stakes. And what they're finding is that it's really, it comes down to the narrative of use. So, remarkably, no one wants to take a powder. It's just not serious, man. You know? The second you downgrade people from injected insulin to pills insulin, they stop taking it because everybody knows injections are serious. Pills? Peh. You know, doesn't matter so much. And powders, nobody takes their powders. You can just forget about it. As a, as a pharmacologist, forget about putting things in a powder. No one's going to take it. And, and, and what that is, is, of course, no one's going to say it. You know, it's very tricky to go into a pharmacological conference and talk about placebo effect because it's a bit like talking about horoscopes and an astronomy conference, right? Um, you know, it's naughty, <laughs> very naughty. And, but, but what it is, is this whole narrative, this whole magic around the medicine. Will it make me better? Will the method in which it is delivered make me feel better, make me feel that's something is being done. Which, of course, is what happens in placebos. In all this work, uh, which I'm doing, um, um, I don't know how to, to put this question, but uh, are you... Are you um, like if, if um, I, I didn't understand if Tiny Thing is part of a university like Medea, for instance. I'm working in various contexts. Okay, I, so yeah. my, my question is, uh, uh, how do you, um, do you publish the results, your experiences? How, how do you do that? How, how, how do I take advantage of, of, uh, of your work after this seminar? Okay, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've deliberately done over the years, which is a really stupid thing to do, but works for me, is that like the project that I've been doing for years with Susan is, is that there's this, in dance and performance, there's rigorousness. Like the dancer turns up in the studio every morning at nine, whether or not they feel like it or not, just because that's what you do. You know, and the performance is based on repeatability. You know, the, nobody really wants to see a ballet that kind of happens as an accident one night. The, 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 you know, you, you have rigorous methods in there. And this is, of course, exactly what you have in science as well. This idea of it has to be repeatable. It is the hard slug in the lab of making things happen. So one of the things that works for me is to work in an art context, which is where I do most of my work, in an art or performative context. But then I try to, to the, my best of my ability, to write everything up academically. And it's a little bit of a silly thing to do because no one is particularly going to thank you. It's not like the art world is going to go, oh great, you have a paper at Kai. You know, like they're going to go like, why are you doing that? It's boring. And, and, and vice versa, you know, the, you go to Kai and they go, you work at what? You know? And, 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 but it works for me because it, mean, it, it keeps me straight in the sense that it's very easy in an art performative context to make it all pretty, or to, to be more seductive than you should be. And, and vice versa, it's a, there's a lot of the stuff from performance and sculpture that is very useful as methods for, for creating things that are actually repeatable and are actually perfectly sane. So I, I, I tend to try to write everything up in various academic contexts, typically in computer-human interaction, stuff like that. They think I'm a crazy person, but, you know, they do still accept the papers. Part of the magic. Mm -hmm. um, no, just a, a word about that is Christina and a few others who I've worked with, not so much me, but Taylor Shiphurst as well, have worked on the f edges of the the CHI, computer-human computer interaction community, for long enough so that the, the whole focus of that community is, is broadening out. And I think it's been the, the perseverance and the determination to present the ideas, unconventional, 
sometimes unacceptable ideas in this format that has actually enacted a change on the, the community. Plus, it's good for us as well. Yeah. I mean, it's hard yeah. to write these stuff. You really yeah. have to know your stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, you said uh, it's m even if it's unacceptable, why, why is it unacceptable? What's the, unacceptable? Well, Sorry, one I'm of the things that happened in CHI, CHI is Computer Human Interaction. Yeah, it's a I very big that. conference for those who don't know. And for example, it used to be that they would not accept uh, qualitative data. They only want quantitative data. So, you know, they wanted scattergrams. You know, if you didn't have a scattergram, you could go home. Uh, you meant your process or something? No, I, I mean, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically the nature of, of, of what counts as evidence. And that has changed dramatically over the last 15 years yeah. I've been involved in this environment. Can I be really naughty and ask the last question, because I want to make a quick change over to Valérie in a moment. Um, my question relates to solitary experience and shared responsive experience. When I saw the video of the woman with the headache hat, I felt, because I've had headaches recently, I felt this visceral desire to go up and somehow help her. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, brainstorming, um, because we have worked together before, if there could be another stage in the workshop which was bringing somebody else into a relational state with what that one person had created. So then you have an improvisation between the one person and their headache hat, and what does someone else do? So it opens the, the individual brainstorming process out to a space of either relationality or dialogue. One of the things that we tried, uh, I, I'm personally working on and, and in the process of setting up, is that getting somebody to put their imagination of a thing into this object. That's one thing. That's what we see in the headache. Now, the question I'm really curious about is, does the, does the headache remain a headache if it goes to somebody else? I mean, clearly it's a headache to you. I mean, you had a headache experience just looking at it. Um, but is that because Alice is talking about it? So one of the things that we're also we're about to start working on is, is what happens when you give these things away? You know, does, can we think of ways of embedding meaning into objects? that will allow them to stay? Or is it purely personal? And also, how do you destroy them? This is a really important thing. That's um, another project of mine is working towards this notion of how do you kill data? When do data die? We all know that you know, it's not a question of whether your hard drive will fail. It's a question of when it will fail. And let's face it, it's a question of when your flat will burn, right? It, in, in theory. And so, you know. That's one thing. But what about all the stuff that lingers? What on earth are you going to do with all the stuff? And, 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 and can we set up systems for, for say, right, that was my old job or my old relationship or whatever the hell, and I would like to take all of this stuff and put it over here and have it, you know, decompose, I guess. And I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff around that. You know, how do you then remove the meaning from the things? You know? Can I end you at that beautiful poetic note there and say thank you ever so much, Christina? Oh,